yo, 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 what up, what up, good morning, good morning, G, M, G, M, Friday, Friday, the February 9th, 2024, look at that, another beautiful day, Ooh, this is on me, another beautiful day to have a beautiful day, <laughs> Sorry we're late, y'all, but we are here, and that is all that matters. I got my co-host, Mando, in the house. Mando, the man of the hour, our superhero. Good morning. <laughs> How are you doing today? Oh, now I can't hear you. Now I can't hear you. <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> he can't give us any shit now. No way, bro. No way. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to, I think, I think Sam's what Mando does. Let's just bring Yad up. Let's talk with, with Yad because he's like, the, that. Mr. Metaverse is the busiest person in all crypto. So we're going to bring him on while we have him. Yad, good morning. GM, GM, can you actually hear me? Yes. Yes. Like the voice of God coming from the sky right now. We've been dealing okay, with this for 15 minutes. <laughs> Okay, great, wonderful. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good morning. Let me let me hold on. We usually start, uh, you know, I chat with Mando and everything. But that's not working. We have you right now. That's the one of the the only the only um, you know play play plage. Sorry, the, the only area for moment in time today that we could get you on. Let me get Open Campus on uh, on on here. Let me uh, let me send the Makoa standby and everything. Mando, I still can't hear you. So I guess you transferred your powers of being able to be heard to Yatsu this morning, so we appreciate you uh, for doing so. <laughs> As we only had Yat for half an hour. Yat, wow, how's everything? It, it, I saw you in Davos, well, actually Mando as well. He was like, hey, look, Yat's here. It was really cool at the Casper Labs house uh, on the promenade, on the main promenade. How have you been since? How's everything going on on you guys' end at Animoca? That's great. I mean, you know, I think, uh, I think almost everyone in our industry would have been in a much better mood as of the last two months, shall we just say. And especially today, it's pretty uh, pretty amazing in terms of to see where, where Bitcoin is in the entire market overall. And it's been driving a lot of activity um, in the area of gaming in particular. Uh, one of our other projects that we've been supporting called Pixels just recently was uh, had a launch, pad, a launch pool announcement at Binance, for instance. Um, so, you know, lots of activity in the space. Gaming is on fire generally in the Web3 space. And just general adoption and conversation is good. So I think 2024 is going to be the year of adoption, right? In the sense that 23 might have been the year of consolidation and cleanup. I think 24 is the year of growth. And by the way, happy Chinese year. It's a year of the wood dragon. Happy and the Chinese wood dragon, year, everyone. Right. And the wood dragon's symbolism is prosperity, growth, audacity, and everything else that I think we're hoping for in 2024. I, I love that. That's some that's some really good stuff. Uh, and 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 of course, like happy Chinese year. This is this is a big moment. You know, we talk about the year of the dragon a lot on the timeline. That dragon, by the way, uh, what well, how do you say dragon in 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 Mandarin? It's long, right? So you know, does that it, does that mean something? Maybe I am actually yet. Yeah, I did some research because I was gonna go tomorrow for breakfast in this local place in Montreal in the Chinese um, Chinese quarter for for like the traditional breakfast. Uh, and uh, and I found out that I'm actually born the year of the wood dog, and so as someone born the year of the wood dog, I have to bow down to the wood dragon, and let him cook, uh, because if I don't, I may give all my money away, and he's gonna take it away from me. So I need to let him cook in in uh, in uh, Web three terms. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was, uh, that's the research I, what I was told. Uh, so yeah, look, it's a pleasure to have you this morning. It's so much fun that you're here. And, and, and I love that the, the update, especially on the gaming side, we're super bullish on Web3 Gaming on this show. We've been talking about it for a minute. And I mean, we cover it every other day. There's, there's news coming out. So it's, it's really cool. And GG on the side of the crypt is just like added um, a lot. So it's really cool to see. So the other thing, though, that's that you're bullish on Adam, okay, which is something you came to talk about, which, again, is something that we're uh, commonly bullish on uh, with you is education in Web3. So let's yes. I, I kind of want to dive right into it and like ask you straight up, like you see Adam, okay, is 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 wide it's a very large company you guys are invested across the entire crypto space uh in multiple you know uh companies here but why is animoca specifically so into um web3 education right we have the open campus account on the stage as we speak too yeah well i mean first of all when you think about our space being gaming actually gaming and education kind of go hand in hand 
because actually whatever you do, right? I mean, in terms of, you know, we learn through play. And these these days, you know, we learn mostly through digital play. If you think about our kids playing on Roblox or you know, playing Minecraft, you know, you know, social interactions. Uh, and so it, it, to us, it's a very natural fit to basically include education in the whole area. Also, I personally have been involved in education. I helped as a sort of, I'm on the board of several schools, helped um, sort of um, found some of the, some, some sort of educational centers and schools uh, in the region as well. I, I always felt that education was really, really important for society, broadly speaking. And also, the other thing is, is that education is something that we all do. I mean, we might say, for instance, that, oh, YouTube is entertainment, but actually YouTube is the largest education platform in the world, for instance, where people go and sort of go and, you know, to learn how to play the guitar, or learn some facts, or podcast, um, or vlog. Actually, those are all kind of forms of education. So we're actually doing that every, every single day. And, you know, education, you know, we talk about gaming being big. It is big, of course, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, over 3 billion gamers. It's a $200 billion industry today and growing, especially when you add in the Web3 mix. But education, everyone does it. And it's a $5 trillion space, right? And, and the other thing I would also add is that, you know, we also looked at it from the lens of how do we get mass adoption in terms of, I guess, um, political adoption as well. And here's the thing. You know, gaming is great and financial sort of you know literacy and sort of financial growth is all great. But unfortunately, these aren't very popular political narratives. But right? you know, politicians don't get elected because they provide better services for gamers, at least not yet, maybe in a decade or so. Right. Uh, and also, you know, you know uh, when it comes to sort of the Wall Street effects and that, that, that um, uh, crypto has enabled, uh, Web3 has enabled, unfortunately, that's not necessarily very popular amongst a certain group of people. However, if we can make teachers more money, who are actually, if you think about it, some of the largest, really probably the single largest creator group in the world, then that becomes a powerful political block, a very strong voice. And actually, you know, if you can basically educate our teachers about Web3, then guess where they're going to educate next? The next generations and the yeah. people thereafter. So as a center, I think focusing our attention on education, I think, is, I think, really important for broader Web3 adoption. Uh, it's also important for the narrative. And I see it very similarly to how, you know, when we looked at gaming, most people forget that we got into sort of evangelizing in Web3 gaming in late 2017, 2018. It was a long time ago. And similarly back then, a lot of people didn't see it. Uh, and of course, today everyone's talking about it. And we kind of think education is the same because in some ways it's everywhere, but nowhere, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, because we do it every day, we somehow forget that mm -hmm. actually, we do this. you know, just ask your parents how much they spend on education on you. Right? And if you don't have children yet, you might not actually fully appreciate just yeah. how much you spend on that. So it's a generational thing. And eventually, everyone yes. here in crypto land is going to go maybe have their first kid. And then they, oh, you know, I want to send them to a school, I want to hire a tutor. And, oh, damn, how much money did I just spend? Sorry to give me anxiety and, attack here. Yeah. Sorry to get stressed out about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I think um, the other thing is, and this is what's so great about Web3 is, you want to actually reward the very people who are giving the most direct value to whoever it is. And so in the same way that we can give artists direct value, we can now give teachers direct value for the services they create for our students, as an example. And then today, again, it's facing the same problems in the Web2 platforms. They're being disintermediated. Teachers are, you know, like in the U.S., for instance, are amongst one of the lowest paid sort of um, people Given the fact yeah. that the role that they're doing is perhaps one of the most important, I mean, they probably spend, many of our kids spend more time with teachers in school in a week than probably even with their families, right? If you think about sort of working families and all that kind of stuff, and yet we pay them way, way less. So there's yeah. something wrong with the system. And I think Web3 can solve that. And so that's one of the reasons we're so focused on, on education and with Open Campus and with TinyTap. So I love what you're saying here because it, it's, I love that because I've been saying like, um, when we founded Rug Radio originally, was always on the premise of like education and entertainment, of course. So it's a mix of both. Like you get on this show, for example. And I always said that like creators are kind of the educators of our industry right now. Like they're in charge of like either entertain you or some of them will uh, educate you. Like, for example, Mando and Ovi do in the morning with the market reports and stuff like that uh, and different topics that we try to cover. But those are people that let, pay the least. Like just recently in Quebec, uh, where I'm from, yeah, there was a huge strike and the schools were closed because teachers were rightfully demanding. <laughs> some help right and and it's always it feels like it's always last people that we think about in society yet you know they're the people taking care of our kids i mean mando just had a child year and something go ovi you know he's about about to, about to happen in 2024 you know wife is pregnant we're so awesome. market baby full market baby that he's gonna yo your baby's gonna be born the year of the dragon yeah that's pretty cool <laughs> that's pretty cool 
you you know but but yeah i want to i want to kick it back to you and ask like so what where does blockchain technology fit here like you said you have tiny tap you have open campus i'm very familiar with both brands and companies and it's really some very uh, some just great companies you guys have 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 funded here but like what what is where does blockchain technology come into play here how does it help so yeah exactly so let me just give you one example there's multiple but let me give you one example that i think is easiest to illustrate you know one of the powerful things about web3 is the fact that we have property rights as in this case digital property rights uh, which means that we can now allow for capital and value formation so normally when you have an intellectual property that could be created by anyone including a teacher it needs a certain kind of value before you can actually turn it into a, sort of a product that you can then basically license and sell out because you know if it only makes a hundred dollars a year or something that's not worth sort of having a legal construct and all the settings around that to basically sort of sell it on for some kind of capital value because the cost of the lawyer and the legal construct and, and, and the systems around it are just too expensive. But when you encapsulate that into an NFT, you're actually able to have the legal provenance, the intellectual property rights, where the money goes in a single transaction that costs less than a dollar, which means that we can now allow capital formation to be created on intellectual property assets that could make as little as just a few dollars a year even, if that's what we wanted. So imagine the scenario. For instance, teachers in Venezuela make between $10 to $15 a month, which is not a lot. And if they make content on TinyTap, which then becomes content in which they could earn a royalty on because of the fact that people are subscribing to it. That's what TinyTap does. But TinyTap is kind of like a Netflix for educational content, um, which, by the way, serves about 200,000 teachers today and roughly eight to nine million, eight to nine million families. What? And so what happens here is, is that when a teacher makes content on TinyTap, on the creator tool, they then basically make revenue because a parent or another teacher uses it and pays a small subscription for it, right? kind of Netflix style which means that the content then becomes basically a layer which basically makes money. By buying the NFT from any third party, the royalty, 80% of that, up to 80%, can now go to the new buyer. And which means basically that the teacher has just created his own intellectual property stream, kind of like, you know, you're a musician and you're basically now able to sort of, you know, sell your royalties on to someone else as a single product. Um, so that means capital formation is possible. So if, I, if this content makes $100 a year, he might sell it for $500 or $1,000 which means that whoever's buying it might make, you know, somewhere between 10 or 20% yield, which is not bad. Um, the teacher makes more money and reinvests it into more content. The owner can actually market the product and actually make more revenue because now he has, uh, he or she has this product that maybe they could sort of even promote further. So for instance, we had a, a Japanese entrepreneur who bought, you know, in some of the early auctions, bought a lot of this educational content earlier on um, and, you know, paid tens of thousands of dollars of it for it. And then basically started selling this education content to Japan, helping localize it, and basically created a bigger market. And so something that was making maybe ten dollars or $20,000 a year now makes double or triple that because she ended up doing some entrepreneurial activities with it, which then also showed us something else. Teachers can make great content, but it's not paired with people who know how to do business. But if a business person comes in and says, wait, I can take this content, I can make it even more famous, or I can make more revenue from it, then we both basically can, can benefit from this. So in a way, it's also tied in the people who know about money and entrepreneurial sort of enterprises with the content creators, in this case, teachers who don't know much about it at all, which is something that's never happened before, right? Teachers were always isolated doing their particular task. They don't necessarily know how to run a business because they never had a product that was worthwhile selling. And basically, NFTs can help solve that. Um, and so that's kind of how we think of this as kind of revolutionizing publishing. And so we call these the publisher NFTs, which is basically a kind of NF uh, sort of innovation around the NFT space that allows uh, teachers and creators to basically have intellectual property rights and, re and revenue streams uh, that come from, you know, ownership of these NFTs. Wow. This is sick. Like, you know, the meme like blockchain fixes this. It's like, this is happening. Like, it's not a meme. It's like, it's actually fixing. Like, it, it, there's a opportunity for it to fix the educational system. Mando, I saw you on mute here. Did you did you have something or you want me to? No, I, I see how this ties in. Right? There's a lot of headlines even a couple of days ago, right? Which was a quote which you were saying, which is like NFTs are the building blocks of capitalism um, or digital capitalism. And that kind of did the round. I think every major news outlet picked up, picked up on it. I can kind of see exactly how this fits in to, to that. Um, it's definitely not a realm which I think a lot of people have looked at from a, like a catal capitalism standpoint but then again peaches aren't making that much money so maybe this is a important way to to go down there. Is there anything else like when you take a step back you're like wow this could also be revolutionized with this with this sort of concept well i mean everything uh if you take it away from the concept of teachers what nfts allow you to do is they encapsulate your intellectual property rights 
And that means basically everything essentially can have the benefit of this capital formation, uh, which is why we think uh, NFTs are pillars of digital capitalism in this case, right? because property rights are the basis of a capitalist system today. The fact I can own my house or own my car is a reason why I can have value formation. It's a reason why we can have assets and which is the reason why, frankly, economies flow, right? If we don't have property rights, we can't have capitalism. And in the digital space, pre-Web3, we actually didn't have any property rights because everything was owned by a platform. We're basically, we're just rentiers. We don't have the right to actually do anything with this stuff because it's not really ours. I mean, even if we have a million followers on Instagram, they don't really belong to us. We can't take them away to where we want to because they don't belong to us. And so this is basically uh, what Web3 Web really fixes. And of course, the other thing that happens is that when you have capital formation, you're actually creating significant value that was kind of already there but now it's something that's distributed amongst the, sort of the, the general population, uh, which is, again, something that we've seen in history, right? When we moved from feudalism to basically democratic capitalist societies, actually what happened was it wasn't that it was taking money away from essentially, you know, the kings of, of their time. It actually created more wealth overall um, and more activity uh, because people were able to build new network effects on top of it. Right? So we see this kind of in the, in the NFT space as well. Uh, you know, if you own a board ape, Someone else can make a game on it. Someone else can target you because you own that ape. Someone creates sort of new skins and costumes, and they can even have the right to basically do a burger joint or, you know, sell alcohol or create water. They, they can basically build all these businesses because they own the rights around that particular ape, uh, as an example. That's actually what property rights enable you to do. And when you forecast a little bit into the future, it used to be that we used to think that, you know, pro sort of our property was a form of our labor, you know, in the classic Lockean sense. But today, our labor is no longer that physical. I mean, some people do physical labor, but frankly, you know, when you look at the future, machines and robots will do all that kind of work. So what is the labor that is valuable to us as humans? It's what's in our head. It's in our mind. It's in our creativity. And so teachers are creating creative content to educate our kids every day. Artists are doing this every day. Game developers are doing this every day. The future of work is going to be very much um, the work of the mind. And so we need to find a way in which we can own that and this is basically why we need a digital context for it, because it's not scalable for us to sign legal contracts for every time we think of an idea. But NFTs can do this at scale immediately. I, I agree with that. It's going to be the work of the mind as a banger. Go on, Mando. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that sentiment. I do think for a while people have said, you know, it's it's the building blocks of, of ownership. You kind of need for it to be fully the building blocks of like um, ownership. You do need like courts and you need everything to kind of catch up with it. Like how... How do you see that happening? Like, I, I haven't looked. I know Tiny Tap is based in Israel, right? So, like, how how do you look at stuff like courts in the different jurisdictions you're in? How do you how, how do you think about stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, we we always have to obviously collaborate and work with governments because at the end of the day, we still live in a physical context. You know, as much as we like to be virtual, at the end of the day, we still have to eat and sleep and pay taxes somewhere. Um, but the the base idea still is, you know, uh, you first need to prove ownership before you can even talk about it. And so this is the point about Web2 is, let's say I use a, I don't know, a platform like YouTube and I make content. If YouTube deletes it, how do I prove that I actually owned it? The only company that can tell me whether I really owned it was YouTube. And if they feel like saying, I'm not sure where that is anymore, which has happened many times, then your content is lost and you, know, you don't have any way of proving anything because actually a third party has become the arbiter of your so-called property. But then in terms of services, you don't have that property anyway. In blockchain, you actually have the ability to prove that you know, the moment it was minted and created. And so this is another thing because it's immutable on the blockchain. And that basically becomes the, almost the governmental ledger as you will, right? It's, it's, a, it's a record keeping to prove it, uh, which is the net first step that you need in order to then say, okay, I own this provenance. Now I can actually go to court if I have to defend and protect it, uh, which is basically, for instance, if someone steals your Bitcoin, you know, five, six years ago, people were like, what's this? But now you can go to the police and you can file a claim and say my Bitcoin was stolen because they, they've accepted that there's a way to actually really prove that that was your Bitcoin. And therefore, we can basically put a claim and we can do all that kind of stuff that's necessary to protect our rights around that. So I think all of that will sort of very naturally flow in. So what blockchain solves is essentially the provenance first, the authentic, authentic ownership of which when we can basically build legal structures on top. Um, and I think the other thing is that, you know, even if the content is only generating a hundred or a thousand dollars a year, when you can prove that, there's another element of enforcement, which is social enforcement. Right? So when you think back in the days when we were hunter-gatherers, how, how were we able to, you know, there was no government. How were we able to enforce essentially sort of our rights? It's because everyone else knew 
that that was your cow, right? So because we're just 100 and 150 people. So even if I ended up taking, you know, Farok's cow, then, you know, basically Mando and OSF are like, well, you know, hold on a second. That's Farok's cow. That, that you know, yeah. like we say it's his cow and therefore you must return it because within our social circle, we had consensus. The problem is, is that when we became hundreds of thousands of people, consensus was no longer possible because we really were done transacting with strangers that we didn't know each other. So we needed government to come in and basically say, okay, this is how it's organized. This is how I knew what it was doing is what. Blockchain solves this because this entire sort of provenance is now on chain, meaning that, you know, if it's Farox digital cow, then, you know, everyone knows it's his cow. Exactly. And if I happen to take that cow, then, you know, everyone else around the ecosystem will know that I took the cow. So it's a social enforcement that comes, which we see today when there's a hack. We create, you know, before the police is even involved, actually there's a social mechanism around blockchain that creates already an aura of defense and, and analysis and, and all that kind of stuff because everyone can see it. So I, I, so I think, you know, that will sort of create more of a sort of, you know, the social, um, um, the social enforcement layer that wasn't possible in digital until today. So, by the way, that was, that was so good. Thank you, Amanda, for asking because I think there's a lot of lot of lot of gems in here and for people to really understand like different use cases of the blockchain, why the blockchain in general. So definitely we need to uh elevate all this. But you came here today to speak also not only about Tiny Tab, but open campus, right? Like they're on stage with us right now, uh on the on the Twitter spaces. So say if you're on here, we're both on video and audio with Yatsu, founder of Animoca. You've all heard of Yat before, his legend, Mr. Metaverse, and uh and he uh, he accepted to to come on video with us. Uh and uh, the open open campus. Campus stuff is where it gets really interesting, right? Like I saw it's 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 actually it's a really big deal. So do you want to talk to us about you know what open campus is? Like what's what's the lowdown on on that? Well, I mean, I think you'll hear a lot more about open campus, but the way that you can think of open campus is that we're basically building it as a kind of educational layer for schools, institutions, and teachers and creators in that field to basically use that as a way to onboard into web uh, into web three and basically build it as the educational platform that really doesn't exist in Web3 today. And in some ways, it's kind of wild to think that, you know, uh, there is nobody really, <laughs> nobody else really doing education at scale uh, in Web3 when it is, in fact, one of the most important pillars of any society. And, and you've heard, probably heard me speak this before, which is that I think of blockchains, layer one, layer twos, and metaverses kind of as, as national economies, right? Um, and the, the way to basically, you know, one of the key pillars of any kind of economy is a state of education that you have in the space. Uh, and it's a protocol, basically, you think of it as that sort of enables and empowers, you know, educators in the space. Um, and, you know, it's powered by the EDU token. Um, so it's a, it's a token infrastructure. We have a creator fund, which is $10 million to basically help basically people who are interested, um, you know, in sort of furthering Web3 education, they can go for grants. It's a DAO. So that means that you can put in your proposals and you can vote. Um, on, on things uh, around sort of which proposals should be funded uh, that basically sort of use sort of, the, you know, it, it could be, you know, I think we have like Web3 literacy programs, we have sort of wow. educational K-12 programs, you know, all that kind of stuff to basically help advance that. And there's a, there's a, there, there is, a, the thing about this is it, there is an actual very practical sort of, you know, um, sort of a financial incentive here, because when you create content, you can sell that content um, and right. the content has educational value attached to it because a, a qualified teacher is doing it. And the buyer of that content doesn't necessarily have to be a Web3 person. It can be someone else who's like, oh, I want this English content. They don't necessarily even have to know that Web3 is powering the back end. They would basically be just be using it on you know, participating platforms like TinyTap, pay a fee. And then basically that fee gets paid to the owner of the NFT, which they can basically buy through Open Campus. And we've got financial institutions like gyms, we've got schools, uh, we've got, you know, and most recently we allow, sort of announced a partnership with Forbes with the OC100, which is basically sort of um, uh, trying to honor essentially, you know, um, the movers and shakers of oh, Web3, right. particularly that are sort of pushing it forward in education um, and, and and so forth. So, so this, you know, it's it's a it is still an early initiative, relatively speaking, um, you know, but it has you know significant financial power behind it, uh, and that's again something that you can really only do uh, in Web3. Wow. This is sick. Like you guys are, this is really, really good. Like I, I love what's being built here and it's super interesting. So uh, it's, I think a lot of people should look into that. So what are, what are some, uh, what are some big wins, right? That you guys, you know, that uh, the project nailed so far, like what are some really. Yeah. So, cool done? Yeah, so th maybe, maybe one other thing that um, before I go into the big wins, uh, maybe I, I just wanted to highlight as well is, you know, when we think about sort of, uh, let's call it impact investing or for purpose investing. Yeah. 
there aren't a lot of projects out there where you can say that if I own this token or if I own this NFT, I'm not just potentially sort of, you know, having personal gain out of, you know, whatever effort I could make out of this, but also I'm helping a broader cause. And by the way, we do this, for instance, today when we choose to sort of, you know, buy green or we choose to sort of, you know, be sort of, you know, um, energy friendly, or we basically look at sort of, you know, sustainable environmental products as an example. Um, and there hasn't really been a mechanism to do this for education when you think about it, even though we all can agree that education is very important, that teachers need to be paid more, that value should be shared across educate, educators more broadly. And so really think about it for the first time, if you actually get involved in the project, you're actually helping a broader cause, in this case, make teachers more money, uh, which then basically creates a positive flywheel, right? So, and I actually think that's a, one of the other sort of hidden powers of Web3, uh, which we can do with NFTs or other kind of projects. It's not just about yeah. sort of, you know, something that is sort of artistic or beautiful uh, or pure utility. There's also the whole element around actually doing something that has really positive impact, which, which by the way, I think will be a, a trend in the future as well. Meaning it's not just going to be in education, it's going to be also for like animal welfare, it's going to be for all sorts of area, other areas, um, you know, like uh, other good causes where, you know, through a tokenized infrastructure, you can basically um, sort of help create sort of positive causes that are also not going to be charity, but actually can be profitable. And so, you know, the example here would be the published NFT sales that we did, you know, we had a, an initial, the last sale that we did had over $1.3 million of demand which for educators is uh, is a lot. Uh, and, you know, some of the teachers ended up making, you know, literally half a year to a year worth of their salaries uh, from the sale of these NFTs. Uh, and, you know, this is actually, again, something really quite fascinating because, you know, when, when someone like a teacher, a creator makes more money, the natural thing they do is, you know, they might spend a little bit on themselves, but yes. then they hire their friends and they build more educational content, yeah. right? You know, and, and this is the thing, right? If, if the person involved on the other side that's making money is mostly there for financial gain, which we have a lot of people in the, in the initial Web3 space as well, they tend to buy other things that aren't necessarily going back into the ecosystem. But, you know, and by the way, we've seen this with NFT artists, right? If NFT artists make money, sure, they, 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 they might buy some nice things for themselves, but they also buy more NFT art. Yeah. They get involved in the ecosystem and they reinvest in them because they're builders, right? So, you know, giving builders more capital actually makes the building environment bigger and better, broadly speaking. So again, we've seen, we've seen um, that effect. Uh, you know, we have uh, several, uh, I think like seven cohorts in the accelerator. We have an open campus accelerator. Uh, we want to bring up to hundred educational companies into the ecosystem by the end of the year, which I think would be quite um, impactful. Uh, we have also launched our open campus ID, uh, which is basically sort of a way in which we can sort of um, start uh, tracking your educational identity and your data around that. So just think about sort of, you know, uh, some of the possibilities that, that could come from that. You know, how do you do provenance, you know, on chain in terms of, you know, your, your degree or your background? I mean, just think about today when you're actually trying to sort of verify someone's background, what do you have to do? Well, you have to call the college, right? You have to get their permission. Yeah. You have to check, figure all that out. Or could you just do it on chain with permission from the end user uh, in a zero knowledge uh, proof way? He doesn't have to reveal everything. He just has to reveal the things that he needs to reveal. And so I know that, okay, he went there and okay, he did this degree and everything else doesn't really matter because really why, you know, when you send your sort of um, sort of a CV to, to uh, you know, to, to work or wherever it is that you do, do they need to know everything on your background, right? They really only need to know the pertinent things that you give them permission to. And that's again, something that uh, blockchain can solve. But you know, some of the other things that are going to be, I think, pretty pivotal, uh, and again, we're not doing them yet, but think about the space that education covers, right? It's not just learning and education. It's things like student loans, financial services. I mean, these are massive, massive industries that are basically controlled by people who are really abusing, uh, essentially, their monopoly positioning. And we know what Web3 and, and, and blockchain can do. Now imagine what happens in a world where you can actually take this type of power that Web3 can already enable, which by the way, is a 1.7, $1.8 trillion space today, right? Underpinned by Bitcoin. And you can actually provide some of that, let's say value down to the student level in the form of potentially loans or something like that. How could that change the world, for instance? And how could that actually create more opportunity in a manner that is more um, sort of um, sort of um, fair and equitable. So, you know, there's, I think the possibilities are endless. I think if once you start going to the education rabbit hole, you start to understand that's why it's a $5 trillion space. And Web3 is, I think, ideally suited to help change and alter and disrupt it for the better. I could listen to Yatsu speak for hours, man. I don't know about you guys. I mean, Ovi, Mando, the future of education is bright, huh? You guys have young, you know, Ovi's got one on the way. 
Mando's got one that's a year old already. Edgy. I, I'm bullish on my future kids when I hear stuff like that. <laughs> this is this is cool. Honestly, like yeah, it's. I think it's a it's a space that needs to be yeah. revolution. I mean, there's been I'm some tech companies out. that have been that have been very very popular. I think if you can if you can form um, degrees or qualifications which people can start to be internationally re recognized, that that would be the real end goal of something like this because then then it can have incredible power i think or we'll maybe on board some of the already internationally recognized um qualifications but yeah it does feel like a space where it the incentives are often misaligned it's very very difficult for people to track quality um like the only only time you can really check track quality of kids education is like parents teacher meetings right or um, and this is a much better way of potentially seeing seeing the value in, in different courses. So, and it, like courses are so big in post education work. Yeah. So, like you know, people have been selling courses for a long, long, long time. So, so um, it does feel like that's a space that could that could move in here relatively uh, relatively quickly. So, yeah, I think it's a it's a very smart industry. I didn't realize it was it was that big in terms of. Um, I guess I guess obviously it's quite spending too. But well, yeah, just a, just. Just think about um, how much your parents um, and how many, for those who may have, have taken student loans, just add up that amount of money before, you know, until university. Just, just, just work back and just start calculating what that sum is. And then suddenly you're going to go, wait a second, actually, maybe that's not even that much relative to the scale of size that we invest in. Right? I, have so, you spoken so, uh, institutions those institutions that you might spend you know hundreds of thousands of dollars on like are any of the big universities interested in this sort of platform have you seen those university endowments i mean these are fortune 500 companies which is like what i mean you know like the idea originally when i first grew up you know i was thinking educational companies they ought to be sort of a little bit more sort of on the sort of social enterprise style and then like wait a second these are money making machines right they're not for profits um, man so they're not yeah. for profits you should you should know how they run <laughs> yes exactly exactly yes oh my i love that so yeah look uh i know i know we we had to start late because of all the bug the the issues we have but i do have a, a couple more questions for you and then you know we're gonna free you so you can go enjoy your, Please, uh, go ahead. your hopefully the celebration is coming up uh but uh Indeed. what are what's the what's the game plan right 2024 mm -hmm. You know, it's it's gonna be a, it's a great year for crypto thus far. It looks like it's gonna be a great year. You know, we're gonna get to the market report for everybody listening after we're done here. But it looks like it's gonna be a good one uh, all around. So what's what's the game plan for for Open Campus uh, and Mocha? And then you know, of course, like what are the uh, exciting stuffs you got you guys got uh, on the on the horizon? Well, I mean, there's a there's a whole bunch. But let me first start with Open Campus. I, I, I sort of teased a little bit earlier. You know, Open Campus ID, obviously. The design is to have that be a core primitive, basically, in the entire open campus ecosystem. You know, for the learner profiles we just talked about, uh, you know, the acceleration program as well. You know, the, the the funding that we set aside for basically people creating content around that area, uh, bringing in many more sort of educational companies that are not in Web three. You know, stay tuned for some sort of pre big protocol based news around that area, um, and initiatives like OC uh, one hundred and Open Campus University that basically really aim to spotlight creators and sort of spotlight sort of you know what education in web3 is all about uh and again you know i gave the examples earlier we just have to scale that out yeah. um in some ways the good news is, is that because it's such a sort of nascent web3 space it can really only go up in terms of growth right, right? it's a little bit like as i said it's, it's like gaming in, in in 2018 2019 right it's like it, it's it seems like a really small space but actually when you think about it naturally it, it can only really grow and expand um, and, and we're obviously hope, hoping that there'll be a lot more participation. But then, of course, the other thing that Animoca is also quite focused on uh, for this year is, is the Mochaverse, right? which is another basically concept yeah. for us that basically helps tie in essentially the Animoca ecosystem of our 450 plus portfolio companies and our various subsidiaries mm -hmm. into essentially one ecosystem, you know, not just in governance, but also in terms of basically using that for, for basically uh, sort of, you know, like a decentralized steam, you know, like examples, for instance, like we've invested in over 150 games and the expectation for us is obviously that, you know, why, why would you have to basically launch a, like your KYC every wallet every, every single time when you basically can just simply do that by, um, by, by having a single ID, for instance, um, you know, and being able to share those network effects basically across your entire network is, is, is what we're hoping that uh, Mochaverse can do. And it's been a, quite a successful uh, sort of community buildup. 
um, you know, and it's kind of cool because it was built over a bear market, right? I mean, it's we started it in 23, which is really, if you think about it, arguably a bad time to do stuff, but that's yeah. actually the best time to do stuff best because time. it uh, brings in a core group of people who are really here for the long term. Because if you were thinking about sort of, you know, a quick flip, um, you probably would have left <laughs> by early 23 uh, and would have been a little bit shy of the space. Um, so so it's, I think we've, we've had the good fortune of building a really strong community. Uh, and as you know, it was effectively almost a, a zero dollar mint. Um, and, and right now, I think it's maybe around, I think it's like four or five ETH, whatever the price is, um, you know, in, in terms of the floor price. But, you know, I think the whole point on this one is it's actually helped put together a really strong community. Um, and and we will we will grow it from there with you know um, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the MochaVerse ID, which I think is slowly approaching half a million um, active users at this point. So, so again, these are the things that uh, we uh, sort of are going to be focusing on. You know, outside of games and investments, you know, we've been very active investors in 2023. Uh, many of the games uh, actually that are about to launch um, are now launching this year. It does take two to three years to make good games, as you know. So these, the cycle of game launches uh, between now and the next 12 to 18 months will be very sort of um, accelerated. Uh, and so as a result, I think, again, we should be expecting to see more broader Web3 adoption from Web2 people who may not even necessarily know that they're playing a Web3 game, but they're basically, basically you know, getting onboarded um, into this whole sort of, um, sort of Web3 ecosystem. Wow. That's exciting. Yeah, it looks like you have a busy year ahead. Looks like you have a, a busy year. Well, is there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bother you for one more question. What are, what are sure. a couple of predictions you got for 2020? What are you some, like, give me like two, three predictions for the year of the dragon. Yeah. Okay, but Well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to be bold about this, um, I think that um, this 12 to next 18 months, we should be hitting our first sort of 100 million users, I think, in terms of the native Web3 space. So I don't mean people owning crypto in an exchange. I actually mean people sort of, interacting basically with like you know wallets and then games and that kind of stuff i think i think you know gaming and hopefully education will help drive that uh, and sort of grow that space um that's that, that's one i guess sort of hope that we have uh, the second one i think gaming will drive a big part of that narrative particularly in the first part of the year uh just because of the fact that i think um you know the games are launching and and uh you, you'll see a, a lot of i guess uh, success in the space uh, as well just because we see this, for instance, what's happening with Pixels and what's happening with, you know, the revival of Axie Infinity and Ronin. I mean, the network effects that are sort of bouncing back from each other, right? I mean, people don't generally talk about, you know, how Axie is doing really well because, it, you know, the media doesn't want to talk about that. But actually, Axie is doing incredibly well, for instance, right? Um, and and as, a, as an example, and, and the space is broadly recovering um, in a in, in, in really good way. The other area I would say is I think this is a year of um, Asia uh, in the sense that, you know, Asia has been at the forefront on the regulatory side of things and has basically been pushing forward, uh, particularly when it comes to Web3 culture. So gaming, NFTs and so on. The biggest game companies in the region, in Asia, are actually adopting Web3. You know, you know, Korean, Japanese game companies are all doing Web3 related projects, one form or the other, in stark contrast to the US, for instance, where they're still shying away from it. Um, and I think, it, again, it has a lot to do with the context of how they view you know, cap capitalism and the fact that their user base is you know, not as friendly towards it for the time being. But we've seen the same thing with sort of free to play and, and the freemium business models uh, in the early days. So I think we will see more natural growth coming from Asia um, than, than the West. However, don't count out the, the West. I mean, and but I think the broad market, I think will be good. It's an election year. So generally speaking, we should expect this to have actually an, a positive impact just because people don't want to create too much instability for all sorts of reasons. Um, I don't see, knock on wood, any kind of major black swans. I think last year, the settlement with Binance was probably the biggest single issue that our industry had to fear. And I think we are sort of clear from that, which is great. And it also told me something else. It told me that contrary to what some naysayers would say, the US isn't out to kill crypto. Because if the US was in fact out to kill crypto, they could have done far, far worse than put an expensive penalty that Binance can actually afford. Right. Um, it told me that the, the U.S. agrees that maybe crypto and Web3 is systemic or it's important or it's reached a scale that essentially has a point of no return in the sense that we have to sort of figure it out. Um, and, you know, maybe the SEC and some people there don't agree, but the rest of the American government is not on the same page, uh, which, again, is one of the beautiful things about the American, American, American democratic system. Right. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not top that way. 
So I feel I feel uh, quite positive about this. And I think that it was a market clarity we saw. The rest of the world is going to be adopting Bitcoin spot ETFs because after all, uh, the US doesn't need to have, shouldn't have all the fun. Hong Kong has already received a number of applications. And I think it's quite possible that Ethereum spot ETFs might actually come sooner in other markets. Oh, Ovi um, loves to hear that. OSF loves so, to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, yeah. Yes, um, but it's great. It's great. Look, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I said, Year of the Dragon 24, very bullish on where it's going to go. I mean, we're generally very optimistic people, but as a, you know, the last two months, if, if the last two months has been any indication, uh, then I think uh, 24 should should be um, a really good year. In fact, if I had to put down a worry, I would say overheating too soon. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, look, we don't want to overheat too soon. That's for sure. But Bitcoin is looking great this morning yet hitting, you know, the best monthly or weekly candle we've printed in four months. I just saw that. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. we'll take that. I mean, I. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that, you know, people, and I think one of the other hopes that we have, obviously, I don't think this will happen in 24, but long term, is that when we get people into Web3 and, you know, they they become in basically more financial literate, uh, just because they have to understand Web3, because everything is kind of in the lens of financial value and services. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully that also means, uh, and this is to me, I think, the bigger picture, that we can basically teach people more about why capitalism is important. Because I think we've reached a point in time right now, which I think is quite dangerous, where people, you know, it's become fashionable to start talking about Marx again and talk about sort of, you know, socialism in, in this matter. And again, I grew up in Austria in a social democratic country, so I'm not yeah. anti-socialist per se. But the point is, is that, you know, capitalism is the engine of growth. It gives us entrepreneurial spirit. It's the incentives that we have that we can have this disruption. And all the people who are basically sort of um, criticizing crypto are actually also critical to capitalism because they fear it. And one of the things yep. that uh, I say to people is that actually capitalism is a proxy for change, right? We live on disruption and change. Innovation doesn't happen because it's harmonious. It happens because we create basically disruptive, crazy new ideas that can change the world. If there wasn't capitalism, we wouldn't have Tesla. We wouldn't have green energy. We wouldn't have, you know, all the things that we enjoy today if it wasn't for that incentive. I agree that the distribution of capitalism has been has gotten messy. But I would also add that's because in the Web2 world, we're not living in a capitalist environment. Because think about this, Facebook, Amazon, Google, they control the market. It's not a free market. If you buy advertising on Facebook, who decides actually what the algorithm, who owns the algorithm that decides what you should get? Why yeah. is it okay that when you spend advertising, you have a one to two or 3% sort of success rate? What kind of success rate is that? If you run a restaurant, that has a one to 3% success rate, you're out of business, right? So the point is that actually the Web2 companies have taken away capitalism from us. They've created their own essentially means of ownership of these productions and have sold it to us basically in this sort of colonial manner. And Web3 basically actually will save us, I think, by reintroducing capitalism and hopefully educating people about the benefits of this because essentially it's anti-monopolistic in nature. And actually, you know, think about sort of you know, how the markets evolve. I actually think that, um, I think Web3 uh, will basically sort of hopefully bring capitalism and the spirit of capitalism and the hope of capitalism back to everyone. Wow. Well, those are some great last words yet. So thank you so much for for coming this morning. Obviously, always happy to, to to give you guys a platform with your building. You know, I think Open Campus and Tiny Tap and what Animoca is funding in terms of education is very important. And honestly, it was great just selfishly to hear it here and, and be able to understand more about it. So thank you so much for coming this morning, Yat, and glad we made it happen despite the troubles yes, of the beginning. Yes, and again, yes. hope you have a wonderful yes. new year. You too. Happy new year. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yat. See ya. All right. Well, that, that was a different start for the show this week, uh, but it was a great one. And it was a it was a great conversation. I mean, Ovi, Mando, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, and a lot of fun, that one. Yeah, love having, love having Yad on. Uh, Ovi, I'm glad to see that you moved apartments and it's seemingly your Wi-Fi still hasn't gotten better. Uh, but it's how, okay. how is it? Is it still is it still lagging for you right now? 
<laughs> no, I'm just playing with you. It's working fine. It's working fine. Why don't we? Why don't we do this? So, uh, I know we started late. Why don't we go? Maybe a little quick little market report because it does look like we're getting Shabbat candles, and you know I like my Shabbat candles. You know I like my Shabbat candles. Are they back? It looks like they may be back. So I'm gonna kick it to one of y'all in a second for market report. Then quick through NFTs, and then look. We have $1,000 to give to someone in the audience. All you have to do is retweet the Twitter spaces. It's pinned at the top. It's also at the bottom right, purple box. Drop a GM, follow Robit, follow FOMO Hour, and retweet the space, and you may win 1000 But Also, the two loot box guys from, from Tuesday. I hope you all are here because I fixed the loot boxes. Uh, I've been maintaining them. Now, there is now a 99.95% chance of winning an NFT. So I fixed that, uh, and we're going to get you guys on again. But quickly... Quickly, quickly, why don't we talk markets ahead of this weekend coming up? Mando, what, what, give me TLDR, man. The, I will, you know, listen, you even saw me. I, the, the ghost of Capo after going through Ovi somehow like tickled me inside, tried to sway me that we were going to go towards the 30Ks. It looks like bears once again in shambles, obliterated, crying back in the mother's basements. What's happening in the market? It looks like we're pumping, baby. Yeah, we're pumping. Um, and oh, we can't maybe, maybe Bitcoin again. Um, can you hear him? I can hear him, but he's out yeah. of sync. Like big time and far. Dude, today is like the, the day of the nothing working. Can this is the me? day. We hear you, but you're out of sync and you're low. Shit. Well, Ovi. Yeah. Just break the market down for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, if things are fucking off to the races right now <laughs> the S&P 500 is above 5,000 for the first time ever we're at once again new all-time highs um, Nasdaq is, is quickly approaching 18k interest rates have been stable um, it's, it's pretty you know we're, we're obviously seeing a large crypto rally today with Bitcoin hitting north of 47k and, and ETH hitting momentarily hitting 2500 but just want to say, like the underperformance of crypto versus stocks in the last eighteen months is still incredible. Mm -hmm. We are at new all-time highs in stocks, and we keep hitting new all-time highs every single day. And crazy in crypto, we're still fifty to sixty percent off all-time highs. So the, the under, I know we're all excited about crypto this year because we're finally seeing some price action and things are moving, and people are making some good money on altcoins and stuff out there, but we're still, you know, a big, big magnitude off where we would be had we been tracking stocks since the, you know, the, the crash in, in, in 2022. So um, I think that's, that kind of explains partially the reason for this big crypto move. I think some of the ETF data has been pretty strong as well. Um, but it really is a risk on mm -hmm. rally right now across global markets. And I just think with the way things are going with stocks right now, and this is post the big macro risk factor, which was the FOMC. So we've kind of digested that now. And we do have inflation next week, but um, you know, we'll see what comes of that number. It does feel like markets want to keep rallying here. And I just think crypto has to catch up. I think Bitcoin has to catch up. ETH has to catch up. And, and alts will catch up too. And yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I know I've been a bit more conservative recently, but with those GBTC outflows now normalizing, and with there being a really strong macro rally as well coinciding with this, it's really tough not to be once again very bullish on crypto here because everything else around you is is performing very well. Yeah, love to see that. You're right. I was just showing, I mean, look, I'm not a big, you know, macro uh guy like you guys, but I, I also keep reading that the 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 crypt like the, the stocks keep just keep ripping higher and higher. We talked about meta last week. Uh, obviously you see a bunch of the different stocks like uh, on the tech side that are just flying. So it's uh, it's uh, the American economy is rolling <laughs> right now. Uh, at least the stock market is. Um, and glad to see crypto. I guess somewhat pin catch up here, Ovi. Right? Because you're right. Um, it was not, you know, you know, going the, the the same way for a minute. Mando, are you back with us? Is, let's test one more time. Yeah, it's okay now. Yeah, it's better. Just hear you from afar, but it's okay. We'll do what we have. So tell me, um, okay, what? I don't have my, uh, my. Yeah, I know. I know it's okay. It's one of those days. It's one of those days. You know, it is what it is. We still, we still delivered a fire interview with Yatsu. So I'm not mad. Uh, and it's Friday after all. So it's chilling. Look, um, that's that on the market side. So you know what then? Uh, unless there's like something crazy that you really wanted to cover, Mando, but I'm, I'm assuming you were probably going to go in and say similar things. Um, the only thing happening right now is 404s. 
Uh, yeah. People around with those, and then, and then, it, like Obi said, just like everyone's getting really pulled up on these e yeah. ETF inflows. Like they are relentless. Um, yeah. As don't fade the ETF, right? Like no. it's every single day, it's a hundred million. Um, that that starts to really um, build up. So you, you do you reckon? Um, do you reckon the coin best coin de coin base desk or the Gemini desk? Just there, and they get this little like RFQ saying of 100k like Bitcoin, of 100k Bitcoin, of 100k Bitcoin. Yeah, you don't, <laughs> what we're referring to is like when we used to be traders, you, you used to get these tickets just pop up on your screen when someone needs to buy something. You'd be like, Oh, I want to buy this. And with the ETFs, it would be relentless, it would just be like you couldn't even see other apps on your screen because there'd be so many tickets coming in from the ETFs. And I reckon that's what they're, they're, they're facing right now. There'll be some ticketing system where they're just getting pop-ups every two minutes being like, yeah, I want to buy, I want to buy, I want to buy, I want to buy. So um, I I don't know how you fade Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin right now, there's big shorts at 50K people are looking at. But then, you know, I mean, you know, maybe maybe this is the breakout um, and you get there. Maybe, maybe we hit 50K and we trace a little bit, but those are just massive relentless inflows it feels like so um I, I just don't think you can fade that people are getting very 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 pulled yeah. up also i mean this is even better for eth right because you know a lot of people you guys have been saying this on the show too like the if the ETFs get approved like uh and if it's closer which is something yeah actually touched on himself and i saw you smirk there you were listening for that part Ovi. that's for sure uh but uh you know that that could be bullish for that but anyway so it's, it's very exciting we'll see what happens over the weekend of course um, and, and, uh, and we'll get excited about that on Monday. NFT wise, uh, some pullbacks across the board when it comes to Bitcoin, uh, the RSICs went under 0.1, they were to 0.128 yesterday, went back to 0.05 or five or something, uh, 0.05 based on some comments like Casey made. Uh, but you know, that's, that, that seems to be a nothing burger. Quantum cats 0.26, the puppets even retraced a bit, but seems that everything's bouncing in this morning. Love to see that. ERC 404 is of course getting all the attention on the NFT front on ETH. Uh, those collections are doing really well. And then Pandora is still pumping. Um, there's a lot of good stuff happening there. Of course, some good crypto punk sale. You absolutely love to see that, uh, at all times. And then last but not least, uh, on Solana, I mean, Solana as a general has seen, has been like very, very quiet on the meme coin and, um. And uh, and the NFT side since Jupiter, but also um, you know a lot of stuff happening on ETH right now with four fours and everything and Bitcoin. Like you know, it's it's again like it's a participants thing. So people probably follow the money there. Uh, but Solana itself, like the token, is at uh, above one hundred five and seems to have broken that that you know it was it one hundred two one hundred three mando that it kept kind of being uh, smashed back down at. So um, yeah, well, I think it's just Bitcoin, man. Like Bitcoin dominance is rising. Bitcoin is beating most up. altcoins today. Like, yeah, so that's again, it's beaten most altcoins. This reminds me of when Bitcoin went from let's uh, go 26k to 35k. Altcoins didn't move, and a lot of people were, were annoyed. If you bring up like Bitcoin dominance, that's the real thing to look at here. We went from about 50% to now breaking towards 54%, I think, roughly. Um, yeah. so that's yeah, that's the one, and I personally think that could be a a bit of a a move here like um like obviously you had that that dip um yeah. a couple of weeks ago but now it looks like we're breaking back towards the those highs and this one feels strong yeah. like this one feels very very strong to me i think bitcoin dominance i would be unsurprised if that heads heads towards 60 percent. so and in that world you're thinking Woo! do you buy a lot of people looking at some of the the Bitcoin alts again, which have started to move. You start to see. Uh, it's not that I don't think altcoins will move, but this could be one of those periods where, like, everyone in altcoins is sitting there going, "Like, fuck, I should just have Bitcoin," um, yeah. because it can be quite painful. All right. Well, there you go. All right, look. All right, y'all. It's Friday. It's eleven thirty a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Why don't we give some money away? Hi, you guys. We're finally all three of us here for the loot box spins. So you have some last chance to retweet to win a thousand dollars. But as promised, as promised, Tuesday we fucked up the loot boxes. Um, and Let's now that I have a full understanding how it works. We have OX free and Great Bane, like we promised. Get them back for a respin. So I set the loot boxes now, as you can see on the screen. The win probability of ninety nine point ninety five percent to win an NFT. Uh, the loot box at 4,600 is around 5,000 always. And that's all the NFT in there with their chance of winning. So we, I added a bunch of pudgies, squiggles. 
I added pandas. I had clones. I had a ton of rec guy, sappy seals. I added a ton of rug radio NFTs, uh, which usually are loaded with rug token and a bunch of stuff. So that's what I did. That's all the NFTs available in there. Sims, are you with us? I am. All right. So who do I go to first? Do we go to Great Bane or uh, as, with, as we did the draw last time, we'll go with the same way. So it'll be Great Bane's draw first. All right. Great Bane, baby. Are you ready for hopefully a more overwhelming outcome here today? I'm just out, man. I'm just out. I can't see the screen. So I'm just waiting for your sweet voice. All for that right, shout. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's go. Let's roll this. Let's go acknowledge. Okay, and let's spin. It's checking contents. Dude, I'm dying, dude. Come on, spin. Oh, it's checking because it's... Oh, there you go. Anyway, NFT. Here you go. Seven hundred fifty-eight dollar value. Congratulations, Great Bane. I would go to claim the rug that FM if I were you and check how much rug token you have in there. So, Yo, thank you for that. Yeah, it's. I'm just excited for that. I'm just okay with anything because it's my second redemption. So yeah. Hell yeah. Happy well, great Bane. Congratulations. You know you want an NFT worth seven hundred fifty dollars for just listening to the show. So thank you for being a listener. Boom, there you go. That's one. So, hey, Ovi, that's better than 50 RLB tokens, right? <laughs> that was like 50. That was, that, was not, that was not our best spin. All right, OX Free, are you ready for your spin? Jam, jam. Yes, I'm ready. Okay. I, I'm feeling it. I'm feel Mando, are you feeling it? You want to blow on it? You want to blow on your screen? All right. I'll blow on the screen, too. And it's a... Oh, it's a scarcity. There you go. Rug Radio scarce to NFT worth nine hundred and twenty nine dollars at current market price. So congratulations! Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hell yeah! There you go. We did it. They got some nice spins this time. Hey, still getting like seven fifty, like a thousand dollars for listening to the show. That's not bad. And we're gonna pick another winner. Am I right, Sims? Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. I'm just starting this now. Let's go. So don't leave yet. If you retweeted the Twitter space at the bottom right, and if you're in the spaces, you have a chance to win $1,000. And I think after that, we still have, I mean, whatever amount is left in the roll bit account, honestly. We are we have 3,000 more. So that means Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's so funny how that was part of our campaign to promote the start of, the, of, the, of this. And it's just dragged upon like 15 shows. <laughs> so we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're giving another thousand, thousand, thousand. And then Tuesday and Fridays, we do the, we do the spin. So make sure you follow Robit. Make sure you follow FOMO Hour, which by the way, did we break 5,000? Come on, y'all. It was close. Come, come on, y'all. I need, now I need, now I need the squad here. We have 400 people on Twitter spaces, 120 on video. Okay. We have, hold on, Sims. Hold on. We have, we need 60 followers to hit 5,000. 60 followers. That's all we need. I want everybody to go on FOMO Hour and follow the Twitter, the Twitter page because we post fire content, great conversations. We have fire guests and more coming, of course. And we pull up every day. Do us a little favor. Let's do that. And with that, Mr. Sims, why don't you roll the die here and see who won $1,000? So make sure you have a roll bit account for that. You know, it takes two seconds to use a MetaMask. All right. I love how he takes his time. <laughs> oh, who is that? Be nice. Be nice. I've seen this PFP before. CZ Bonice. CZ Bon Ice. Is that what it is? Bon Ice? It's a, it's a penguin, like an actual penguin, not a pudgy penguin. It's a real penguin PFP. You have 60 seconds to request to speak, to claim your thousand dollars, or else we're gonna have to give it to someone else. But don't leave the space just yet. And if you're on video, come on the Twitter spaces. C Z B O N I C E. You are the winner of one thousand. No, not you, Burn. We don't want you to request to speak. Thank not you, Burn. You. There he is. There he is. There he is. CZ Boniche. I'm going to call him Boniche. And it's Bonice, but Boniche sounds nicer. Yo, CZ. Hello, CZ. Can you hear me? Well, you're on stage, so you win. Cool. He got even hearts. He's on stage. He wins. He listened to the show. Congratulations, CZ. Bernie, who we did not allow on our stage this morning. We should allow him sometimes to come fuck around with the lads. Um, 
<laughs> you win $1,000. Mando, Ovi, what are your plans this weekend? Oh, I don't mm. know. You don't know? Coming to London. House. Coming to London on Sunday. We go to London. Nice. Oh, yeah, you're moving homes, right, Ovi? I've I've now moved. That was quick. Um. Yeah, it took me about two days to do you everything. Didn't notice you set up? No, I know he moved. I just didn't realize it was that quick. Like for me, a move is like a week long thing. Well, everything is in right now. Everything is in boxes, basically. Yeah, so I'm thing. basically going to spend the weekend getting fun. everything set up. That's fun. That's a lot of fun. Huh? I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna spend the weekend vibing. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do nothing because we have Paris coming up, and Paris is starting to line up to be a really big one. So I think I'm gonna keep it very cool until then, health wise. Yeah, I'm <laughs> not, not gonna lie. I'm pretty worried about Paris. I'm worried about I'm worried about Paris as well. We're doing something together, right? You guys, you saw the booth. We fire. The booth looks Why amazing. About Paris? What, what, what are we worried about? I mean, his health. I mean, I am worried about my health in Paris. We have like four big days and big nights ahead. Literally, we're opening Paris with the, our house, followed by a wrecked event of your drinks. Yeah. Then the, the RLD dinner with also PGPP in there. So you know how that's going to go down with Mo and the crew. And then another rock radio event at the casino. <laughs> and, and then the Reach event at the Rasputin. That's what we're worried. That's why we're worried. You know? Yeah. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. We love y'all. Let's see if we hit 5,000 followers on, on our account. We did not. Well, hey, you know, I take it back. I don't love you guys. I just like you guys. Uh, you know what? All you guys can give me is 10 more followers. F-O-M-O-H-O-U-R. Come on, y'all. Come on. You know what? I'm going to go on strike on Monday morning if we don't have 5,000 followers by then. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> we should do that. 100%. Is, is we'll just, do a show next week unless you have 5,000 followers. Yeah. Right? <laughs> You know, fuck. Is it, does this go for everybody? This goes for everyone. Yeah. All right. I'm down with that. <laughs> Shut up, Sims. I mean, Sims is so much work that he's just like, yeah, okay, I could use one. All right, y'all. We'll see you on Monday morning. Maybe, maybe hey. Monday, maybe 10 30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Peace out, y'all. <laughs>